Alonzo T. Jones, The Home Missionary Articles, November 1893. But you can see how we are coming face to face and into close combat with the beast and his image. You can see that. Well then, brethren, that being so, is it not important that you and I become thoroughly acquainted with the spirit of prophecy? Not simply acquainted with a person who has the spirit of prophecy. Not simply become thoroughly acquainted with a person who is a prophet, but become thoroughly acquainted with the spirit of prophecy itself. There is a difference between having confidence in the spirit of prophecy. You may have confidence in a prophet because you are acquainted with that person and have confidence in the person and have had opportunities to understand the claims of that particular person to be a prophet. But if God should speak by some other one to whom you had no opportunity to apply the physical test that would satisfy you that that person was a genuine prophet, then how would you know whether that person was a prophet of the Lord or not? This is worth considering because there are going to be more prophets before the third angel's message closes. And that you may see that, I will read a passage. Second chapter of Acts 17th verse, quote, It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters, end quote. Oh no, your daughter shall prophesy. Is that it? Quote, your daughters, end quote. Plural number. That is not all. Quote, your sons, end quote. Whose sons? Your sons and your daughters. Is that so? Well now, suppose one of them should prophesy some day. How would you know whether it was true or false? That is the question. Suppose someone should write a testimony to you as from the Spirit of God some day. How would you know whether that were true or false? You had no opportunity to see that person in vision when the matter was given. You had no opportunity to apply the physical test which the Bible has given. The Lord has given physical tests which, when they can be applied, are proper enough. We cannot do without them. It is all well enough. But suppose a testimony comes really from the Lord to me, from one whom I never knew to be a prophet or anything of the kind. We will say it is really from the Lord. How am I to know whether that is genuine or not when I have never applied and have had no chance to apply any of the physical tests which the Bible gives. How can I tell? Before believing that testimony and acting upon it, am I to wait until I can see that person have a vision and apply all the physical tests that the Bible has given in order to know whether it be a true testimony or not? The testimony might be very urgent. It might be some important duty laid upon me. But am I to wait to hear whether that person from which it comes has had a vision, or wait till I see that person in vision in order to tell whether it is true or false? Brethren, there is a better way. Quote, my sheep know my voice, and they follow me. End quote. Now that you may see that there may arise such occasions as that, I will read of one occasion that did arise. Turn to 2 Chronicles 20th chapter and 11th verse. A great mass of heathen came up against Judah to destroy them, as they are massing the heathen against us now to destroy us. Jehoshaphat was king. He called all the people together, and they prayed unto the Lord and fasted. He said then, beginning with the 11th verse, quote, Behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. End quote. They were in a strait. They wanted help from God, and nothing would answer but help from God. What then? Quote, then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mataniah, 
a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and of King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. End quote. Did he have a vision there, and that whole multitude have a chance to come up and apply all the physical tests that the Bible gives in order to be sure whether that was from the Lord or not? There is no evidence written there that he had a vision at all. The Spirit of God came upon him in the midst of the congregation, and he prophesied in the name of the Lord, and it was true, and the people knew that it was from God. How did they know it? Ah, they knew his voice. I am not saying anything at all against the application of all the physical tests that God has given. I am only saying that when we have no opportunity to apply these, you and I need to know his voice that we may answer when the Lord speaks, and we may know what to do when he speaks, even though we have not the opportunity of applying these tests. Therefore, as God has promised that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, remember that is not all. Quote, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. End quote. Sons, daughters, young men, old men, that is not all yet. Quote, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. End quote. Sons, daughters, young men, old men, servants, and handmaids. God says that out from all these he will call persons to be prophets. Well, suppose he should. How are we going to know? We are to become acquainted with his voice, so that when he speaks we shall know the voice. Quote, my sheep know my voice, and they follow me. End quote. And the devil cannot imitate the voice of Jesus Christ. No, sir. He cannot imitate the voice of Christ. He may speak in the very words that are in the Bible, but it is not the voice of Jesus. No, sir. Therefore, become acquainted with the voice of Jesus, brethren, and that means to get your heart filled with the word of God, so that in your hearts and minds will be ringing the tones of his voice. And then, when anyone speaks from him, the tones will combine and harmonize with the tones that are ringing in your hearts and minds already and you know his voice. Fill the whole heart with the words of the Lord. And this only brings to us afresh the importance of more diligent and earnest Bible study than we have ever engaged in before. That is what we must do or else we shall be deceived. We shall certainly be deceived if we are not acquainted with the voice. If I am not acquainted with the voice of God, is there not danger of my rejecting the true word of God spoken to me because I do not know the voice and have not the opportunity of applying the physical tests that God has given? If I do not know the voice, is there not danger that I might reject the true word of God and endanger my eternal salvation, cut myself off from ever having a knowledge of God and walking in His way? And we are in this danger today. Because the time has come when God is pouring out His Spirit upon the people, and there will be more than one prophet. And when another prophet shall speak in the name of the Lord what he will speak, you and I will be in danger of refusing Him and of rejecting the testimony of God if we do not know His voice. General Conference Daily Bulletin, February 5, 1893 Quote, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, end quote. Thank the Lord, he is not going to be content much longer with one prophet. He will have more. He has done a wonderful work with one, and having done such a great work with one, what in the world will he do when he gets a lot of them? As you can see, the Adventist pioneers rightly understood the spirit of prophecy to be the Holy Ghost working through a living prophet. 
Not only that, but they understood that this gift would not cease from the church until the second coming of Jesus, and some even went as far as to say outright that we are to expect more prophets in the church. A natural question then is, when did this important truth get lost sight of? When did the church stop teaching the scriptural truth of the spirit of prophecy and start claiming that a set of books is the spirit of prophecy? The following article, written in by Alonzo T. Jones in 1916, the year after Ellen White's death, answers this question. The Spirit of Prophecy, the False and the True, A.T. Jones, 1916. In the Western Canadian Tidings of July 26, 1916, there is printed an official communication of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination by Elder F. W. Papp, Home Mission Secretary, North American Division, that is of interest to many people beside those of that denomination. This communication is in promotion of the purpose to have every SDA family to buy a set of, quote, the testimonies, end quote. First, there is quoted Revelation 12, 17 and 19, 10, thus, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and bear the testimony of Jesus Christ. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then upon that there is said the following, We wish to emphasize the words, quote, and have the spirit of prophecy, end quote. Yes, they have the volumes of the spirit of prophecy in their homes for the purpose of getting the counsel into their hearts. That word says that these people, quote, have the spirit of prophecy, end quote, by having or because they, quote, have the volumes of the spirit of prophecy in their homes, end quote. And even then, this is not in order or for the purpose that they shall get the spirit of prophecy into their hearts, but only, quote, for the purpose of getting the counsel into their hearts, end quote. And that is only plainly to say that these volumes are the spirit of prophecy, and that the people and that denomination, quote, have the spirit of prophecy, end quote, by and only by having, quote, the volumes of the spirit of prophecy in their homes, end quote. Above the Bible. If that be so, then what of the volumes of the Bible in their homes? Are not these the spirit of prophecy too? To this question, the SDAs answer no, and they have always answered no. Now, it is indisputable that whatever is the spirit of prophecy is of a higher order and character than anything that is not the spirit of prophecy. Therefore, when they say that the volumes of the Bible are not the spirit of prophecy and that these volumes are the spirit of prophecy, then in that, beyond all question, they give to the volumes of, quote, the testimonies, end quote, a higher order and character than they allow to the volumes of the Bible. That fact they can never escape. They cannot shift their hitherto always occupied ground and now say that the volumes of the Bible are the spirit of prophecy. For that will be only to say that the volumes of the Bible always have been the spirit of prophecy. And then by their own words it will be admitted that all through the ages those who had these volumes of the Bible, thereby and therein, had the spirit of prophecy in their homes for the purpose of getting its counsel into their hearts. But for them to take that ground would be to annihilate their claim in behalf of, quote, the testimonies, end quote, which claim is that this, quote, spirit of prophecy, end quote, is a new and peculiar development that marks a specific time and work and that distinguishes that denomination as the special and peculiar people of God. Accordingly, by their own official printed words, they are shut up to the fact that they do give to, quote, the volumes of the spirit of prophecy, end quote, commonly called the testimonies, a higher standing and character 
than they allow to the volumes of the Bible. Their claim nullified. Further, the basis of their claim that those volumes of the testimonies are the spirit of prophecy is that they were written by Mrs. E.G. White and that in these times, quote, the spirit of prophecy was manifested through Mrs. E.G. White and through Mrs. E.G. White alone, end quote, who was thereby, quote, a prophetess, end quote. But in the autumn of 1915, Mrs. E.G. White died. Then even they could not claim that the spirit of prophecy is manifested through a person who is dead. Therefore, they are now under the necessity of shifting the spirit of prophecy from that person to that person's writings. And even these writings only in a certain set of volumes. This shift, then, is assertive of the claim that whoever has the writings of a person who, while he lived, had the spirit of prophecy, after that person is dead, has in his writings still the spirit of prophecy. But that is again to say that whoever has the writings of the prophets of the Bible has in those writings the spirit of prophecy, and that all through the ages this has been so. And this destroys the very foundation of their claim as a denomination that because of the spirit of prophecy as manifested through Mrs. E.G. White and now in these, quote, volumes, end quote, that denomination has a specific and peculiar standing and character as the true church and people of God. Their Dilemma Again, till Mrs. E.G. White died, their constant claim was that the scriptures are not the spirit of prophecy because the spirit of prophecy must be manifested through a living person. And for them now to publish, as in the official words above quoted, that they have the spirit of prophecy in having, quote, the volumes of the spirit of prophecy, end quote, is positively to shift ground and therein deny what they have always formally affirmed and is also to admit that the volumes of the Bible are and always have been the spirit of prophecy, or else still hold that the scriptures are not the spirit of prophecy while these volumes are and thus give to these volumes a standing and character above the Bible. And if to them another prophet should arise, the spirit of prophecy would have to be shifted back to the living person, and then, quote, the volumes, end quote, as the spirit of prophecy would be completely nullified and stranded. Yet in truth, no more than now. Surer than the Bible. Again, upon the scripture, quote, where there is no vision the people perish, end quote, their stock argument has been that in order that the people shall be safe and surely guided, so that they shall not perish, there must be visions, and these the visions of a living prophet. Now the person is dead in whom, quote, alone, end quote, they centered all true or proper visions. And now to them, where are the visions without which the people perish? Will they say that these volumes are now the visions without which the people perish? Even this is actually implied, and in fact is almost said, in the following sentence of Elder Papp's article. They are given us for a specific purpose, and without their aid that purpose cannot or will not be attained. And that again gives to these volumes a standing and character so far above the Bible that with the Bible alone the people perish. But with these volumes... They cannot perish because in having the volumes, they have, quote, the spirit of prophecy in their homes, end quote, and so have the visions and are safe. What now? Again, while Mrs. White lived, their claim and argument was, quote, we are the true people of God because we have a prophet, end quote. It mattered nothing to them nor to their argument that repeatedly in public and in private the one whom they claimed to be a prophet asserted that she was, quote, 
not a prophet, end quote, and made, quote, no such claim, end quote. Against her own plain word repeated, they insisted that she was a prophet, and that they were the true people of God because they had a prophet. Now that person is dead, and they themselves must admit that now they have no prophet. And confessedly having no prophet, can they now claim upon that basis that they are the true people of God above any other Christians? Or will they now claim that these volumes are a prophet as they claim that the volumes are the spirit of prophecy? They can claim the one as fairly as they claim the other, and the one claim would be just as true as the other. The, quote, infallible, end quote, interpreter. Finally, since they affirm that now these volumes are the spirit of prophecy above the Bible, and as such spirit of prophecy are necessarily infallible, then it follows that these volumes must have an infallible interpreter. They will not allow that the people are qualified to interpret and apply the volumes, each one for himself. There is no right of private judgment there. That final and infallible interpreter must be, quote, the church, end quote. And this, quote, the church, end quote, simply the few or the one in the church who can gain the position. And whether this be on occasion or permanently, the principle is the same. And so that church occupies exactly the corresponding position as to those volumes that the Church of Rome occupies as to the Bible. And that church with these volumes stands to the Bible exactly as does the Mormon Church with the Book of Mormon and the, quote, Mother Church, end quote, of Christian Science with the volume of Mrs. Eddy's. The True Spirit of Prophecy The Christian truth of the spirit of prophecy is far better than and or all of that quicksand of error and delusion. And here is that truth, quote, When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, and he will show you things to come, end quote. Whoever from God shows things to come is a prophet, and that which is thus shown is prophecy. Here is the personal spirit of truth given, quote, and he will show you things to come, end quote. There is the spirit of prophecy. There is the true spirit of prophecy. And there alone is the true spirit of prophecy. Whoever has him showing to him things to come has the spirit of prophecy. And he is the free gift of God to every believing soul. Receive ye him, the spirit of truth. And when he is come to you, he will show you things to come. And he, and he alone, is ever and forever God's own and only given true and infallible interpreter and guide. Quote, My prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of revelation. End quote. Ephesians 1 verse 17. Conclusion Although more quotations from the Adventist pioneers could be presented here, there does not seem to be a need, seen as the information already given, is sufficient to make the point. Now to conclude this subject, we will summarize the main points of what we have learned from start to finish. Number one, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Number two, the spirit of prophecy was in existence from the gates of Eden and will continue on until the second coming of Christ. Number three, heaven's law and order is for God to speak through prophets. Number four, Without living prophets, God's people perish. Number five, we are sanctified by truth, and thus the continual unfolding of truth through the spirit of prophecy is the method through which God designs to bring us to perfection. Number six, interpretations belong to God who reveals his secrets through his servants, the prophets. Number seven, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus by the Holy Ghost and through a living prophet, or the Holy Ghost speaking through a living prophet. Number eight, keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus are the two primary identifying marks of God's remnant. 
Number nine, the Adventist Church understood, believed, and taught the Bible truth concerning the spirit of prophecy during the lifetime of Ellen White. Number ten, after the death of Ellen White, the denomination abandoned the scriptural teaching on this subject and began to claim that the spirit of prophecy is the writings of Ellen White. All this brings to mind the familiar words, quote, We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history, End quote. Review and Herald, October 12, 1905. How dreadful a thing indeed that we have forgotten, and as a result we have not kept pace with the light, 5T, page 80. It may well be said to us, quote, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the Just One, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. End quote. Acts 7, verses 51-52. to so, what is there for us to do now? Quote, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. End quote. Acts 3, verse 19. Quote, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. End quote. Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9 that we may all come into, quote, the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, end quote. Ephesians 4, verse 13. By Trent Wilde, The Branch. Website www.the-branch.org.